In order, we've got Spencer McDonald. He's the co-founder of Spearbit and is a senior advisor to Lincoln Network. We've got Sam Troutman next to me. Sorry, Troutwine next to me. He's building decentralized dark pools. We'll get into exactly what that is soon. And then finally, last but not least, Paul Bohm, who's building Teleport, which is best described as Web3 ride sharing. Let's just go down the line and kind of take from the rapid fire session this morning, how close do we directionally, I'm not asking for a prediction because those aren't fun, but how close are we directionally to Web3 going from a niche to the billion users that are requisite to make that conversation no longer there? Let's we'll start with you, Sam. Yeah, I mean, I think it's to some extent inevitable, um, but not in the way that like I was expecting. Um, a lot of this technology um, will slowly seep into just the stacks that are underneath existing fintechs. Uh, it'll, it'll seep into like, I mean, you've already seen uh, these coins just show up in random brokerages. Um, so like, I think it will keep just kind of expanding silently, uh, whether or not we like it. Yeah. Um... I got a question for the audience, by the way. Can, can everyone who thinks crypto is a scam, can you guys raise, raise your hand? Anyone? Oh, wow, okay. So Marshall, I think that's like a indicator, right? I think we have a lot of work left to do. I think to baseline the conversation, so if you look at the, the monthly active users of the Web2 incumbents, um, like we got Antonio in the audience. Antonio used to be a Facebook PM. Facebook has, I think, 3 billion or so monthly active users. Um, Ethereum has around 15 to 20 million. Uh, so obviously orders of magnitude difference from the Web3 side. It, it looks better on the, the financial side. So if you look at Robinhood, Robinhood is around 15 million active users. Um, and wallets like MetaMask that allow you to do DeFi are around 20, 20 to 30. All, same thing with Solana. Um, so yeah, I think um, we, we've gotten some product market fit, and we can talk about what product market fit looks like for crypto, why you need to use blockchains versus not. Um, but I think to go from the 20 to 30, maybe at most there's 50 million active users across all these chains to a billion, which is the title of this panel, I think there's some structural constraints that we have to improve on as an industry. So we can get into that. Yeah, to connect or continue with the kind of statistics that Spence uh, brought up, I think there was a recent report by Dune Analytics where they showed there's 2.5 million daily active wallets. Uh, that doesn't mean daily active users, quite often they call it that, but we don't know how many people are active daily. I think uh, in the space a lot of people have been talking about uh, you know, a parallel economy where it's kind of you have the metaverse, you have DeFi, it's all connected, it's completely separate. I think what it will take to get us to that next level, and I think it's possible in the next 10 years, uh, maybe faster, is uh, doing the hard work of actually interacting with the existing system. So if you look at the big crypto companies so far, and I'm not talking about coins that are in their you know, private world to some degree, but really crypto companies, they're the off on ramps. And I think the next big, uh, Companies in the space are actually going to be companies that do real things, so bits, not atoms. So like transportation, uh, ride sharing, creating solutions where you kind of create shared ownership uh, of everything that has happened. Uh, right, Web2 promised us Twitter would be a platform. It has an API. And then, you know, at some point Twitter got so big that the CFO decided to just, you know, shut that down and there's no API. Similarly, we were promised eBay would be a neutral platform and that's been shut down. So I think our promise for Web3 essentially is to take a lot of these Web2 protocols that were supposed to be platforms, right? We don't we use email, not email.com, and essentially turn ride sharing into a platform, turn Airbnb into a platform, turn everything into a platform where move from the gig economy to the entrepreneur economy where everyone can participate. That's what it will take, I think. Where the users have ownership. Where the users have ownership, exactly that. Could you each, we'll start with you, Paul, because you kind of talked your book with the reference to ride share. So we'll just lean into that. Like, go down the line, start with you, Paul. Like, what are you building or working on in the space? Right. So I've actually, so I have a little bit of a, my two feet in different parts of uh, the space related to ride sharing and crypto. So I've been 
working on digital currencies and peer-to-peer -peer protocols for a long time. So I was at Dropbox. I wrote the peer-to-peer -peer protocol there. I've worked on peer-to-peer -peer protocols for a long time. And also before I came to the United States, I built what is now Austria's largest food delivery company. So I've kind of seen how that space works. That was back in 2008. And what I, what I find interesting in that space is, right, you have all these free-floating gig workers enabling that economy, but they don't actually have as much freedom as they should be having. So what we're specifically doing is we're turning ride-sharing into a protocol. It's called the TRIP protocol, the TRIP initiation protocol. We have a company also that's called Teleport. It's one of the ride-sharing companies participating in this. But every driver, every operator, every taxi company out there is invited, every entrepreneur out there, to start their own ride-sharing company and share the liquidity of drivers and riders and kind of build an ecosystem together. And I think that can be a model for taking on the tech giants in every space, not just in ride-sharing, but just basically saying many small, small Davids band together and uh, take on Goliath, whatever the Goliath in their industry is, where there's a natural monopoly for you can only have one transportation company, you can only have one eBay. Well, maybe that one entity should actually be a protocol and not a single company owning all of food delivery, all of transportation, all of speech, right? So that's what we're doing. Yeah, to, to complement what Paul's doing, I think Paul's trying to bring user ownership to the, the gig economy. Um, so I'm, I'm the co-founder of Spearbit. We're a, a marketplace for blockchain security auditors and security researchers. Uh, so we're bringing ownership to the freelance team economy, right? So right now in Web2, you have all these uh, talent marketplaces. Um, TopTal would be one. Uh, Fiverr would be another, right? Um, and these are folks that, uh, like in TopTal's case, you know, they're software developers, they're, they're skilled uh, freelancers. And um, Marshall, I think you guys have talked about this on the realignment. There's this you know, trend towards remote work and distributed uh, organizations. Um, the problem, though, and this is to Paul's point, is... None of these freelancers before have uh, had the opportunity to have like a stake in these uh, freelance networks. So that's what we're trying to do with Spirit. So um, the, the problem we're trying to solve is, um, and you guys may have seen this in the, in the news, uh, this month, October 2022, uh, around $700 million of hacks in, in DeFi, crypto. And we could talk about why that, that is. Um, so smart contracts are complex, right? Uh, all the code is open source. Um, and if a hacker finds uh, a vulnerability in that open source code, um, they can exploit it and they can make more money easier uh, than hacking a centralized uh, database because you know, if you hack a crypto project, you get money automatically versus if you hack Google or Facebook, you have to sell the data somewhere, right? Um, so it's a, it's a complex problem. Um, there are people that can solve it, right? There are uh, particularly freelancers that can solve it. Um, but they needed to be brought together in a, in a kind of streamlined and, and curated way. And then they needed, a, again, a, a protocol layer to interface with, with projects that need a security audit. So that's, that's what we're solving. Um, and we think that um, you know, the, the space to get to a billion users um, needs the, both the cybersecurity infrastructure, but then also, on a, on a broader level, the professional services infrastructure uh, to professionalize the space so we stop having all these hacks and we can actually have the organizational structures that can support a billion users. So. Yeah, so we're building, a, we're working on decentralized dark pools and market architecture today, both across equities and crypto, is far too focused on um, individuals trading individual like shares as opposed to people trading large blocks. And this, in, this ends up more or less creating like a, a quiet tax on just the efficiency of all markets. Uh, crypto is easier to basically test things out on, and we're pretty confident. The killer the killer dApp so far for crypto has been dollars. If you look at stablecoin, if you look at basically stablecoin growth, uh, especially like in emerging markets, uh, it's, been it's been an incredible job just basically extending um, dollar access to people all across the planet. And we think basically crypto is going to drive like the emergence of bearer assets and it's also going to kind of also play a role in hardening a lot of our technical infrastructure, going back to what Spencer's working on. Um, because crypto effectively creates bounties on any piece of infrastructure where if you can break it, you can immediately profit. Uh, and we're, we're seeing a lot of the trends we saw with the internet um, play out again. Like the internet was initially started, like, 
all the content that we consume, uh, and like all the online shopping was initially supposed to go through the cable companies. Um, the internet was this weird niche academic thing that was really built to uh, allow our communications infrastructure to survive ICBM strikes in the Soviets at the time. Um, and it ended up, because it was less centralized, it ended up being much more robust than what the cable companies, what John Malone was working on. Um, and we think crypto can, we think crypto can do a similar thing for global money. You kind of got at the Spencer. What would you guys say is wrong, quote unquote, like with the crypto space right now in a way that's clearly, let's say, preventing the, 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 the growth, the aggression? Like you could say we want about Web2. It seems like once you had the underlying use cases, the underlying like articulations, Facebook is moving at a quicker pace than crypto has. Yeah. So what is wrong, quote unquote, with the industry in the space that's preventing that? The elephant in the room is product market fit, right? So why do you need a blockchain? That, that's, the, that's the fundamental question. Um, so my previous job, I was the Army CIO's product manager at the Pentagon for developer security for the Army's enterprise uh, cloud environment. Uh, and I had the opportunity to uh, talk to a lot of folks uh, inside government uh, that had done enterprise blockchain projects. And uh, most of these projects, frankly, did not pan out. Uh, and why didn't they pan out? Because inside of an organization uh, where you know the parties in a transaction, you don't actually need a blockchain. You need cloud. You need digital transformation. You need actually what the big tech companies have been working on in Silicon Valley for the last 20 years, right? But where do you need a blockchain? When you have parties in a transaction that don't trust each other, or maybe they trust each other, but not as much as inside of a, a super centralized institution. So obviously there's use cases that have product market fit. Uh, you know, you brought up one, DeFi, right? The ability to do cross-border payments, like for Spearbit, um, we don't have a token uh, yet, but um, we do have freelancers in places like Uganda uh, and, and Argentina. I have no way to pay these people without using USDC. Uh, and then furthermore, uh, we have a, a Gnosis safe um, that functions as the kind of the community treasury where the freelancers in our community can see how much clients pay the legal entity and then they can see how much they are paid. So they know the take rate of the marketplace, right? Which, the, and to Paul's point for, for Uber, the drivers are kind of trusting Uber and trusting their quarterly audits that like the percentage they're making is actually the percentage they're actually getting paid, right? So. Um, there is product market fit, but I think entrepreneurs in the space, one, I think the bear market is going to stop the, the Ponzi schemes that we saw at Terra because you're not going to have as much you know, retail exit liquidity, right? Um, so I think the bear market will be good for that. And then second, I think the bear market is also going to force crypto entrepreneurs to really focus on the true value propositions of blockchain versus trying to throw blockchain on everything. Yeah, I think Spence really some, like, hit the nail on the head here. Trust is the key word for anything crypto related. You don't, if, if, if you have trust, if you trust all the parties, everyone involved, like there's no, you know, it's under your control. You can solve it in some other way. There's no reason to do anything with crypto, but why do we, do we have that perfect trust everywhere, right? So we, we, we have like a long history of playing around with trust. We can do trust on the side of the government in the post-World War II order. With Bretton Woods, there was an agreement of managing the dollar in a certain way, and that promise was abandoned later. We've had uh, Bank of America starting something called Bank AmeriCard, and then later the membership banks saying, you know, this doesn't really work for us, and so they created a nonprofit organization that was supposed to allow them to compete, but also cooperate, calling that Visa. We have, I would, like, I have a few more examples because I think they're, they're really poignant here. Um, we've had Twitter creating a whole ecosystem of APIs and saying we're an API company and then just shutting it down. So here the, we have certificate authorities, 300 certificate authorities can make any encryption certificate out there and a lot of them are probably can be leaned on by governments. So we've handed all this trust to entities that we don't actually really trust. So now my take for, for, for a role for crypto is maybe just like you know the founding fathers in the United States have come to this conclusion, maybe there are certain powers you know, certain rings of power that are so powerful that no human should hold them. And if we could find a way to throw them back into this mountain in which they were forged, and we just, so to say, 
uh, create a compact, an agreement on how things should be managed and how things should be working, then we can do things like saying, well, here's a ride-sharing platform that we're actually collectively investing in. Here's a, uh, you know, something like Twitter, a platform where you can post, you can invest in, you can develop clients. And the company owning that is not just gonna shut it down or a food delivery company that is not gonna start up its own restaurants and then hiding the other restaurants to small business. So there's that, that's the promise for me. And to do that, you need to be willing to engage with existing regulation, with legislators, with constituents. You need to think about how that actually affects the people involved. I think part of what we've seen so far is people have been off in their metaverse, you know, parallel economy. But the moment we're moving into the real world, it's gonna take people doing that work and then making it secure because otherwise it's not gonna work either. Quick, quick follow up, Paul. Here's where I'm skeptical. You just gave like a uh, excellent like political philosophy op-ed. Like the centralization's bad. There are all these alternative models, but I see a gap between what you just articulated and your point, Spencer, Spencer about like actual users. And I, what I'd be skeptical of is I see a significant number of people who'd be incredibly compelled by your argument. I don't see that being a billion users. So how do you think about this dynamic? I, I, I have a fantastic question. Uh, so I think it can't be more difficult and there can't be extra steps. And right now when you use crypto, like you have all these onboarding, on-ramp, off-ramp. What we're building, you can use a credit card. There's no KYC involved. You're just getting a ride. Uh, the driver gets a normal background check. It's the same level of safety. There's insurance involved. So my take, what's been missing is people being willing to say, sure, there's this layer two roll up version of a abstract ride sharing dispatcher, or you do what we're doing, we're being pragmatic. We're creating a network where you have what we call adapter companies. So limited liability corporations under normal, you know, US law, state law, that can actually interface with the local ecosystem, with the airport, with the municipality, with the insurance company. Similarly, if you want to get into the app store, you need an LLC, you need or something like an LLC that can go into Apple, that can work with the credit card companies. That's what we're doing. And I think we won't be the only ones. So to the user, to, to Sam's point, the very first thing he said, it's going to be a little bit hidden. It doesn't mean you can't actually use your wallet. You have a full crypto wallet on your phone. There's just not going to be any extra onboarding. It's just as easy as the existing system, except it's collectively owned by the drivers. I think what I'd add here is that um, we need stronger investor protection. Um, like there's too much investment, and like there's too much investment and too much fraud. To be very honest, like both in terms of projects getting hacked, uh, like both fraud where like fraud's being committed by the projects, and fraud where like money is just getting stolen. But whenever that happens, like whenever basically um, middle class Americans uh, throw money at something and end up losing money, um, that's where the government feels a need to step in and um, take control of how like things develop. And equities were very messy in the 20s. Uh, like the majority of actual innovation around human coordination has like very, very uh, chaotic origins. Um, but for the space, for to actually accelerate development, what we need to have happen is it become less of a casino and more of like more, more like uh, just development of infrastructure. And then, yeah, to kind of follow on Sam's point, so Marshall, to answer your question about, you know, um, I, I think I think effectively your question was like, what is the impact of crypto now, right? Given that the monthly active users uh, pales in comparison to Web two, um, relevant counterpoint would be VitaDAO. I'm a VitaDAO maxi, by the way. So uh, VitaDAO is a online organization that funds life extension research. Um, and they pool capital um, and uh, have a community full of research scientists and people interested in you know, biotech, biohacking, and life extension. Uh, and then they go find um, you know, academics in uh, you know, regulatorily friendly jurisdictions across the world and they run studies. Right? Why is that important? Even if VitaDAO is not successful in any of the studies they run, it's positive, and I would argue complementary competition to the current academic institutions you know, in the, the standard universities we have today. Right? So even if VitaDAO is never you know, finding the, the cure for cancer or um, 
you know, extending aging or whatever, it's still putting positive pressure on the existing incumbents. Something I'd be curious about then, because it's easy just to like dunk on Web2 and they made all these promises, and there were promises. It's not like hyperbole, but things obviously worked, quote unquote. Like they got to the billion user numbers. Like what lessons from, let's say, peak Web2 era defined as like the growth? I, th I think someone had a good line earlier where they say like a startup is different than a company. So like when you're transitioning from like that startup to company period, like what lessons should Web3 investors and founders take from like that era? One is a focus on product and users. Like you have to validate a, a hypothesis before you build a product, not the other way around. Like you don't build a solution in search of a problem. You figure out the problem and then you build the solution for that, right? And again, going back to the earlier conversation about not misapplying blockchain when it doesn't need to be done. Like just focus on user experience. And, and that's the Paul's point about what he's doing with onboarding. Um, you know, same thing for us at Spearbit really hammering in on, you know, we have a two-sided marketplace, we have freelance security researchers, we have clients. It's our job to make uh, both parties um, have, a, have as, uh, you know, relevant and uh, generative of an experience as possible. Yeah, Fo focus on the users, focus on the use case. Uh, there's a lot of projects out there valued in the billions, which is absurd to me as someone who's very, very bullish on the space, mind you, right? It's, it feels a little bit like it being in the 90s and, you know, seeing things like, I, I, I guess, uh, Vapvan was one of the large 90s companies investing in all these warehouses, billions of dollars, but the users weren't there yet. And then years later, Instacart comes along and is basically like, well, I can just get in my car and pick up, you know, like some stuff from Whole Foods for you. There's really smart ways to handle it where you focus on the problem first. You don't over-engineer. I think that's what we got to do. We got to provide actual value right now. And then on, on the lessons learned, if you design right now, and there is a little bit of a, a promise in there. If you design right now as a centralized company with a direction of credibly spinning it out, the same thing Visa did, where you actually give up that control, uh, some, something really... like. I don't think you can retrofit it, but if you build this, what you can do is you can spin it out into a protocol. And I think this could do something we've, we've never seen in history. We could get institutions that can be competed with. So if you spin out a protocol, the very trick that you use to make people switch over, saying, you know, if you invest with us in building this instead of, you know, building in the swamp of where everything is sucked up by someone else, but you build with us, uh, you're a part of this. Well, someone else could be doing this to you. So for the first time in human history, we might actually be able to create monopolistic institutions that can be competed with. And I think just there's this line, you know, it will be good for the people doing it, but it also will keep us all honest. So I'm, it, it's both a movement and a commercial venture to build in the space. And I think that's got to be acknowledged too. It, it really is a movement because it's, it's, I'm trying to build a world I want to live in. And I think all of us do. Yeah, and, and to Paul's point, I think the, the movement part is really interesting. So I, I just got back from uh, DevCon in Bogota, um, which is a very large Ethereum conference. Um, and th there's a very idealistic crypto culture, to Paul's point, um, and people in the ecosystem actually mean the things that they're saying. Um, I think the, the central tension, though, is how do we do that in a way that uh, is pragmatic, right? Uh, and that's it's a balance, right? Um, and obviously, you know, as a cybersecurity person, I lean more to the, you know, pragmatic, some would say paranoid uh, side of the persuasion, right? But I think that's, that's going to be a key thing is like continuing to get people in the space that can help build out the core infrastructure. So not just cybersecurity, but like I'll, I'll kind of talk about some other projects. Um, Twally is a, is a cool professional services DAO. So crypto accountants, lawyers, to Paul's point, people that can help crypto projects interact with the the real world system. We're gonna need to, again, build out the surrounding infrastructure um, if we, we want real world impact, so. I'd say um, have an open mind, but stay skeptical. Like we're effectively just testing narratives. Like this, this tech is new. Uh, we don't know how it's going to integrate with our society, with our existing rules, with our existing financial systems. And so like you could view almost every cycle in the space as just firing a lot of narratives at people and just seeing what sticks. And so we'll probably continue to see like a lot of market volatility. Like Bitcoin will probably go up. It'll probably go down. Um, 
I don't have, I have very low confidence on anyone's ability to predict like the future in this space. Um, but it's also like, there's also gonna be incredible opportunities and we'll see things that no one thought were possible. Um, DAOs are super neat. Like DAOs, uh, there's a long history. There was carve outs basically in, um, when the SEC was organized for investment clubs. And so we're actually kind of seeing things that have been legally allowed, but like just unused for decades, getting dusted off and rebooted with technology. Yeah, I, I agree with Sam that it's, it's really tough to predict like the individual winners, right? The same way that in the 90s, right? Like, you know, who, who knew that Amazon specifically was gonna win versus, you know, the 100 startups or literally thousands that failed. However, what I would say is that you can understand the natural product fit. And the natural product fit is, again, anything that centralized institutions suck at, either consciously or they just choose not to do, that's a potential opportunity. And that's why I always go back, and I'll repeat myself, but the Vitadel thing is super interesting because that's been something, that's been a community on the internet, right? It's been talking about this weird thing. Maybe people don't like it, that's fine. But there's enough people that do like it, that do want to do research in that area. And to Paul's point, like they're doing real world stuff. Like they're doing real world um, research because they coordinated capital in bit space. So they, they coordinated things, uh, or sorry, they coordinated it in bits, right? And then they moved it into atoms, right? Got like a, a bunch of follow-ups, but I want to like build on what you just said here. The, the idea of like what do centralized institutions like suck at? I think another way of thinking about most things is like what, well, depends. So like, uh, especially at a user I, level. I'm, I'm spicy because I my yeah. last job was at the <laughs> Pentagon, so. So, so, like, so like think about it like, email has been solved for a while in the sense that what someone is trying to do is send a message to someone else. Um, what are problems that have been apparent since basically the inception of the internet that are still open to being solved? So like, even if you're talking about like the API debate in Twitter, that's like a debate about how Twitter should be run. But the question of like, how do you get text to people? That part has kind of been solved. So it seems like an opportunity for Web3 to be like, what were some things that the internet could have done that centralized or decentralized Web 1 and Web 2 just couldn't do? I think these guys will probably have better answers. The one thing I would say, though, is uh, payments built in at the protocol layer, right? Like, I, I think... I was going to say... You're going to say that? Oh, yeah. yeah. I think... Well, I'll, I'll let you take away, but I think that there was conversations in the early, like in the 90s, right, about building in a payment standard into HTTP, right? There, you know, everyone's seen a 404 page, right? Like, you know, saying file not found. Well, there's an error code. 404 is an error code of the HTTP protocol, which is an open protocol that keeps getting developed, right? We're getting to... Even TCP IP still gets getting upgraded, right? You could say like all these open standards like email, oh, they get abandoned, but they've seen a lot of development even though they didn't have the payment layer. What's interesting now is the coordination and payment layer that made it impossible to build payments into HTTP. Well, it's here now. So to, and, and I think sometimes that's lost on people. So there's a problem in, in computer science that was 40 years old, basically unsolved. It's a coordination problem. It's called the Byzantine generals problem. And we knew this problem is unsolvable. It's essentially the question, if there's no central authority, right, we might all come together and we agree on something, but then later on we can change our mind and just, you know, change the constitution we put on the wall. We just switch it out. No one notices. The consensus is never permanent. And Satoshi realized if you Satoshi, the creator of Bitcoin, realized that if you essentially make it economically extremely unappealing for some people who verify and keep their eyes peeled on that piece of constitution on the wall, that the rules don't change, it's really hard to change the rules. So hard in practice that it hasn't happened. So um, I, I, I think we have these tools now. They slowly came to us since 2009 because this 40-year-old that's why people freaked out so much when Bitcoin came out. The first response you got from most people when you told them, oh, this guy solved the Byzantine generals problem was not, wow, it was like, you're insane, that's impossible. So having this tool since 2009, doing the impossible possible, we can actually build payments in, and now we can actually decentralize all these protocols that came later. We can do that now. And I think it's going to happen, right? That's, that's my wake up call here. It is going to happen because we can do it now. No. I'm sure there's people who would, but no sane person today would build Uber today like they would have built it in 2009, 2010, when the implications of what Satoshi did were not clear yet. We're gonna build very different companies and it's not all 
all going to be monopolies from here out. It's going to be protocols. Wait, so, sorry, quick follow-up. I mean, you could argue that you would build Uber today the same way because you, as the owner, would take all the value. Like, isn't your point that under the protocol you're building, you could have a bunch of different companies, but obviously the incentive today would still be to build, like, Uber. But you can you could potentially get to bigger scale, though, right? And obviously we need to prove this out, but with any of these crypto networks, Spearbit or, or Teleport, if you give users more ownership, they're more incentivized to keep on coming back to the they marketplace. They would lose. So the argument, you okay, know, so so the the argument is not ideology. Don't switch over because you know, it's a good idea and all oh, the poor. No, it's better. It's hard to compete. Right? We've got to go from this narrative of like you use crypto because you want to, even though it's 20 extra steps, to it's just as easy. It's cheaper. The rides are faster. It's higher quality on every level. The drivers are nicer to you. The quality system is better. The ratings are better. There's more drivers. It's just a more liquid market. And entrepreneurs can build additional apps on top of this, right? Innovation opens up, right? Do you really think eBay is stuck in the 90s because that's the peak of what a marketplace can be? It's because we stopped innovation. We do this every single time. A monopoly seizes something and shuts it down. TCPIP sees more development in the last 10 years than Uber has. It's stuck. eBay, stuck. Uh, Brexit, stuck. All of these platforms, they seize it, then they stop. And, and, and to Sam's point, you know, it, it has been done right now in terms of the virtual casino. It has. And there is a long history of, of things being proven out as toys, right, where people think the use cases are more superfluous, which they are, but that's okay, right? Because we do have user-owned networks with digital art, right? You don't have to like NFTs to then say that, oh, well, you know, what Paul's saying is simply like the next logical step, right? Because you already have user-owned assets. Now the next step is user-owned companies in the real world. Um, but it's, I think it's a logical progression. An interesting uh, thing to look at here, there was a transition inside Web 2. Um, I mean, you could argue this as part of like Web 1 to Web 2. Um, when encryption was rolled out, uh, you couldn't really do things like Facebook or banking on the internet early on because you didn't have like an encrypted up and down link. Um, I think the impact of crypto, both to the internet and to emerging markets, uh, is going to be akin to the introduction of encryption because you're just able to add money to things. Like most people on the planet don't really have access to um, most financial instruments, uh, like borrowing, saving, lending, um, and a lot of other fiat currencies, uh, as, we're, as we're seeing right now, um, don't really do that well when in, in, in highly volatile scenarios. Um, and so I, I think this democratization of dollar access is something that like, will probably be a narrative that just keeps driving crypto forward. But Marshall, I can, you know, to kind of assume your question, like, again, like with cross-border payments, you know, if you look at the daily active use of USDC, like Chainalysis just came out with a report um, Uptake of global remittances, particularly in like Southeast Asia, uh, Africa, South America. So again, some of this conversation has been future facing, but then there are you know concrete use cases that are taking place today. I think the last broad question I want to ask you guys. I want to go, Paul, to your point about the 1990s internet, the dot com bubble. Um, it's one of my favorite metaphors in the space is the idea like. In Great Britain, in the 1840s, you had like the big railway boom, there's this huge bust, but what matters is that even though the companies like all fail, you had the railway networks and that's what builds the Industrial Revolution. Same thing is true in the 1990s. Pets.com and all other, the 10 variations all died, but what matters is that broadband was expanded. That's what then you build Web 2 on. Then obviously you have the survivors like eBay, Amazon, et cetera. What do you think, given the bust, the current market conditions? Like, is there an equivalent of something that was built in the period between 2017 and basically the crash where we're going to look back and say, you know, there was some cringe there, but we're glad this underlying infrastructure or idea or even introduction was there? I mean, I think the EVM, uh, the Ethereum virtual machine. I mean, to, to your point, uh, something that's probably going to be pretty frustrating here is it's its highest impact will probably be completely uninvestable. Um, Warren Buffett had this interesting point. It was, I think, his 1999 Sun Valley talk um, that the average investor in car companies in the 20th century lost money. Uh, cars went from not existing to being something, I don't know, it's like two cars per American now. 
Um, over How do you lose money on that? Yeah, but like on average, investors lost money investing in car companies. Um, and so I think there's gonna be a lot of things. Like the EBM is something that like is completely revolutionized. Um, I think we all are EBM users. Uh, anyone who's touched crypto has, used, has, been, has touched the EBM. Um, it's not even clear if ETH and EBMs, like ETH's, token, ETH's, ETH's uh, tokens performance and the EBM are even tied together at this point. Because almost every other, like many other protocols would like just borrow the EBM. Um, but same with the stablecoin stuff. Like it's not clear how outside investors can even benefit from like one person in Southeast Asia sending dollars to someone else. Yeah, I think the EVM is a great choice. Um, on top of that, uh, apps built on EVM, uh, Uniswap and OpenSea, uh, in my opinion, by far. Uh, the ability for anyone on the internet to, to spin up a, a pool uh, and transact uh, with anyone else, big innovation, Uniswap. The ability for uh, our artists and other digital asset creators uh, to list their asset, get paid for it, OpenSea. Huge. I think they're going to both be here to stay. I concur with both of these to some degree, but I think for me, the key innovation itself is, is, is the coordination layer so that we can actually uh, build things. And I think just my journey of like following Bitcoin since 2011 to now, I think the thing that blew my mind in 2011, I thought, cool, so we have a you know store of value that is not like like gold, but just with a teleporter built in, fantastic. What's changed for me is I'm not entirely sure that the nature of money and currency will actually stay the same because I think in the near future, it might be possible, you know, that someone wants to be paid, you know, if Spencer wants to be paid in tomato futures and I want to pay him in fractional Apple stock and, you know, some uh, dark pool in the middle uh, wants to essentially convert between the two and we don't even know this, right? This, with the same user interface as like Apple Pay right now, does currency still exist at that point? Because I can trade anything against anything. So that kind of ties, I think, a lot of these, you know, the automated market makers, the EVM, but also crypto itself, or rather the consensus engine together. Yeah, so I think this is a great place to cut it. We could do this forever, but this is a really great panel, guys. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.